Hello friends, I am Ashish Dabari, founder and CEO of Axiomize. To our new listeners, welcome. To our old ones, welcome back. Okay, so let's start with the news. So we are going to be doing a webinar on 27th of April. I know a lot of you have signed up for it, but in case you haven't, please go to our website at axiomize.com and sign up for it. We're going to be talking about a lot of exciting stuff on RISC five formal verification. Okay, so let's start about today's topic. So I'm going to be following up on what I was talking about in the week before last when I talked about process and planning and verification technology and methodology. So I want to build up on the same thread and now I assume that you are actually already into the aspects of process and planning and you're looking forward to putting some planning in place and getting your selection of verification technologies and everything in place. So let's talk about getting started now. So we have a new project, let's say, and we want to start our verification. So I want to talk about requirements. So we're going to talk about a typical design verification flow that starts from requirements and specifications and ends up with a sign off. So requirements and specifications play a very important part in establishing what can be obtained from a verification task. The general rule is that if it ain't specified, it won't be verified. After all, you know, any testing and verification exercise needs to know what is being tested and what is expected from a test. It doesn't matter if the underlying test and verification environment is simulation based or formal verification based. Having said that, or, you know, formal verification and, you know, uh, specifications play even for, for formal verification, specifications play even a more important part. And the reason is because formal verification environments are very brittle. Properties fail very easily in a formal tool that may not fail for hundreds of cycles in a simulator. And that's because the formal tools are different from the simulators. For hardware or even software verification, a good specification must describe the relationship between inputs and outputs of the design or a program. So basically what we're saying is describe the interface. For hardware, from my own experience, this is where most bugs reside. And also this is a boundary where we can establish exhaustive proofs. So breaking down a big design verification task into smaller interfaces specific smaller verification tasks is a natural first step in an FV project. But exactly what should go in the interface specification and how complex can these things become? So let me answer the first part of this question, which is easier to answer. Specifications should describe what is the relationship, not how. Okay, no matter how many times I say this to the people I work with, it's always worth reminding them. For example, every incoming request will be granted at the output could be a description for an arbiter. However, we could make it even more precise and say, well, every incoming request will be granted five cycles later at the output. Now, we could make it even slightly more precise or more different. So the requirement could be that every incoming request for an odd numbered requester gets granted in two cycles at the odd numbered ports, while the requests at the even numbered ports would be granted in five cycles at the even numbered ports. So you can see the variation in what is being desired of the design and this is going to have an impact in what will be modeled in the test bench and what will be obtained as a final outcome in verification. Now, this is you know, so, so important to understand because although our example we just now gave is simple, for any bigger, more complex system, the variations can be so many. And if they're not captured precisely, 
then we get spurious failures, missed bugs, exhaustive proofs, but about partially specified requirements. So all of this is not going to be very useful and on the whole verification would just become a nightmare. So then you must be asking, why don't we just go and write clear and ambiguous specifications, right? And who should write these? Well, who should write these? I would say the designer should write these, the architect should write these, verification engineer should write these. All of us should work as a team to develop these. But now let me describe why we don't write them as often as we would like. And there are multiple reasons. So writing a good, clear specification is a non-trivial exercise for any complex design. And often the management doesn't value the role of specifications. In fact, I've heard in some previous projects I've worked in other companies that, hey, we don't sell specifications, we sell design IP. So why are we going to write specifications? Well, that may be true, but I'll tell you why we should write specifications later. But let's see when the specifications are written, they're not describing what. So I've often seen always a spec document of some kind, but they're not describing what, they're describing how a design is built. Well, this is better than not having anything at all, but is also dangerous, especially for formal verification, as a lot of production grade formal verification relies on building auxiliary test bench in Verilog or VHDL and having insights from a specification document about how the design has been implemented means it contaminates the verification engineer into building the formal test bench in the same way, causing common mode bugs to be missed. So how to make writing specifications easier, right? How do we do that? So writing specifications are non-trivial, um, in a, <coughs> sorry, it's non-trivial for, sh for sure for any complex design. But this can be made vastly more efficient and easy if formal methods were used in the first place for specifications. So now my friends, uh, some of you might know, I've used theorem provers for many, many years, um, over two decades, but I'm not suggesting you use these for formal specifications, although it would be good if you did. But you can use what you already know. You can use the power of Verilog and VHDL and system Verilog assertions and PSL properties to accomplish writing specifications. In fact, if you recall Harry Foster's podcast from last week, he mentioned that one of the reasons OVL became attractive to designers was precisely for this sort of task, to describe design behaviors. Now, although OVL is fairly limited in what it can capture, SVA can be used for specifying anything from functional requirements to safety requirements, security requirements, power, performance. There are absolutely no limits. If you want to know how, get in touch with us and we will show you how. It is easy to do this in our training programs. We, we do this all the time. Now, regarding the comment I made earlier about management not being appreciative of the effort of writing specifications and burning time, you should ask the following questions of your management. How are you going to sign off your functional coverage in simulation or formal if you don't know what you are chasing to begin with? Ask them another question. How many bugs were missed on the last project because we didn't specify and hence did not verify those cases? What was the cost in the last project for fixing spurious failures because properties were under constraint and thus we were looking at failures that were not true design defects? The cost of not specifying requirements clearly can be catastrophic, causing in some cases for an entire ASIC to be respun. And here we are talking about several million dollars. So hopefully these questions would make the management collectively think about the value of investment in writing good specifications. So let's say now you're convinced and your management is convinced that we must all write good, clear specifications, but don't know how. Well, that's already a good start. So remember I said we could use SVA or PSL to specify requirements. Yes, in fact, we can use them without a design implementation to build a model of the design that will be built later. A fantastically exhilarating exercise it is to do this kind of work. 
And now there are several ways to do this, and I can't go into details on this podcast today, but we can do this together in our training program. Um, but one thing I must point out is that it is not a designer or an architect's responsibility alone to write good specifications. I want to remind you of this. Every project I get to do some exciting formal verification work, it's always my desire to leave behind a clearer set of specifications and requirements. The simple rule is ask good questions from the designer and you will be astonished to know how much information was residing in the designer's head that is now known to you. A focused Q&A exercise followed by extensive formal documentation can save everyone precious hours and severe frustration later. After all, if you go to the designer and say, hey, I want to know something, and the designer says, well, what is it that you want to know? And you say, well, I don't know. You know, we are all deadlocked. He cannot tell you what you don't know unless you actually ask some specific good questions. So have a think about this, right? Having domain knowledge is always useful to understand what are the good questions to ask, but when you don't have the domain knowledge, then you have to double up and acquire that all within the duration of the project. Yeah, sounds exciting. That's what the life of a good verification engineer is. So, after all, if you think about this, why is it important to do? If a DV engineer's understanding of the design is any less than the designer's own understanding, there is no hope that the verification engineer, DV engineer would be finding the bugs all of the bugs or building proofs on all of the essential requirements. So understanding the domain, making an attempt to specify the key requirements, doing specific Q&As with designers to fully understand the scope of what is being verified and remember what, convincing the management of the value of good specifications. These are all the interesting things we have talked about today. So go back and ponder over some of these issues. I would love to know how you are coping with some of these things in your own uh, projects in different organizations. And I would love to get more feedback on this. So friends, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Do let us know by emailing us at info at axiomize.com or going to our Axiomize YouTube channel. Stay connected, stay home, Stay safe and we will be back next week.